All right. So uh, thanks everybody for joining today. We're going to try to give um, a, a relatively comprehensive overview of monkeypox with a focus on the clinical diagnosis as well as testing uh, where we stand right now and cover a little bit about vaccine, which is also a rapidly evolving area of the monkeypox response and should have plenty of time for questions at the end. Okay, so one thing, and so certainly I know we have lots of providers on this call who um, treat all kinds of um, STDs and other diseases. So we are going to be showing uh, pictures of rashes of sensitive areas, including the genitals. So we just wanna make sure that everybody is aware of that. All right, so just a really quick overview on monkeypox disease. So this is not a new disease. We've known about it for decades. However, um, it is relatively rare. Um, and while it can be life-threatening, that is actually also very rare. Um, the virus that causes monkeypox is an orthopox virus, and it is actually endemic in West and Central Africa. Um, the specific animal reservoir for monkeypox is not entirely clear, but is likely small mammals. Um, and it can spread from infected animals to humans, as well as person to person. And that's obviously where we are at with the current outbreak. And it can spread via respiratory secretions, skin to skin contact with infected body fluids, as well as fomites. And we'll be talking more about that a little bit later. The incubation period is relatively long. So four to 17 days, the average is five to 13 days. But uh, if there's a plus here, a person is not contagious until symptoms begin. And that includes um, any respiratory symptoms. So our experience with monkeypox in the past has uh, really been related to persons who traveled to parts of Africa where this is endemic, and then a large outbreak about 10 years ago related to um, infected small mammals that were imported. So this is the situation as of July 6th, um, and it has evolved since then. Uh, so I believe we're actually up to seven or 800 cases in the United States, but wanted to just give a little bit of an overview because it's really important as we think about the patients that we really want to be focused on both for testing and diagnosis, but also for potentially vaccine. Um, so just looking at a subset of these cases reported so far, the median age has been in their 30s, but the range is very large, 20 to, to 70s. Um, almost all of these patients have been male um, sex at birth. Um, and important to understand is that uh, most of the exposure risk for the patients in at least for this 305 have been male to male sexual contact. Um, that said, there still have been a few females affected. However, no cases in children in the United States and no deaths in the United States. There have been a few hospitalizations, but those were primarily for pain control related to the location of the particular lesions. So let's just kind of quickly do an overview of kind of the rash or actually the whole kind of um, process for, uh, the, for the disease. So as we talked about, the incubation period is five to 21 days. So I think since we've been in COVID, everybody kind of knows these terms, but we'll try to talk about that. So that's after exposure, how long it would take somebody if they were infected to actually show symptoms. So within that period, five to 13 days, but as long as 21 days. The infectious period uh, starts generally with the febrile stage, although that is not always present. That febrile stage looks like a flu, but something that is um, of interest and predominant and different from flu is lymphadenopathy, okay? So fever and lymphadenopathy are things that we really wanna be paying attention to. However, people can also have headache and chills and kind of the other things that we think of in a flu-like illness. And then within five days, a rash will develop. Um, and that is the rash stage that can last two to four weeks. Um, and then after that is the recovery phase. And we'll be talking more in depth about um, what the rash looks like. So this is the rash progression. So, uh, and again, trying to show as many pictures as we can um, over the last couple of months of this outbreak, uh, more pictures from uh, more variety of patients um, have been shared. So we're trying to show um, as many different pictures from different types of patients as possible, just to kind of give folks kind of as much of a breadth of what can be seen when it comes to monkeypox, because that is something that we're learning. You know, because this um, disease has been 
primarily uh, among uh, folks in Africa, you know, we haven't been able to, and, and is rel still relatively rare, we haven't been able to see the breadth of disease. And now that we have a lot more people affected, I think we're really starting to see the breadth of disease and including the breadth of what this rash can look like. So when the rash appears, can start off as a macule, evolves to a papule. And I think that these images, kind of the cartoon images at the top, helps us think about like a little bit of the what the disease is actually doing to the skin and why it looks a certain way in the skin. Um, so papule, then vesicle, then pustule, and then that crust lesion. And in terms of thinking about infectiousness, so as we said, folks are considered infectious at the time of any prodrome, so any fever, lymphadenopathy, or malaise, you know that is actually the start of the infectious period. A person is not considered, uh, their infectious period ends when their lesions are actually scabbed over and new skin is forming under that lesion. All right, so I think just everyone, uh, just kind of looking at the different types of what, how the rash evolves, I think we all recognize that this can definitely look like other types of rashes that might be more common. So just to kind of do a comparison of monkeypox, chickenpox, which is still relatively common, and measles, luckily very rare in the United States, uh, but just to kind of give folks an idea of what we're looking at here. So monkeypox, again, uh, there is often a prodrome, not always, certainly within five days of that rash being it being developed. If someone has a prodrome and then that rash develops more than five days later, that is not monkeypox. That is something else. Um, and so monkeypox, the lesions often are in one stage of development. OK, so something that, again, these are not considered to be like absolutes. But when we're looking at all the different rashes that clinicians see, monkeypox, we're probably thinking more if we're seeing lesions in, often in one stage of development. The rash development is slow. It's not like all of a sudden you have all these things. They are going to start off as a couple and then evolve from there. The rash distribution can, can be more dense on the face. It can also be present on the palms and the soles, which is really, really important. You know, I know in medical school, we were like banged into our heads. There are, cert there are only certain things that cause rashes on the palms of the hands and soles of the feet. And this is another one that we have to be thinking about. Again, as I mentioned, lymph adenopathy is actually pretty um, prevalent with monkeypox. Um, and death, again, luckily uh, with the outbreak so far has not happened in the United States. There are actually two strains of the monkeypox virus. The strain that is in, involved with this outbreak right now is the one that is associated with less mortality. So another good thing there. So if we compare monkeypox to chickenpox, um, so again, can have a prodrome uh, a little bit shorter before the rash. However, the lesions in chickenpox are more likely to be in different stages of development. So you might have, you know, one vesicle that's healing over here and then a new vesicle um, starting on a different part of the body. It is a more rapid progression uh, for chickenpox. It starts um, on the trunk and then goes out. Um, definitely not something that hap happens on the palms of, or the soles. Um, and we really don't see lymphadenopathy there. And then again, measles, again, luckily, really certainly much rarer than chickenpox, uh, maybe a little bit longer of a prodrome, but also with lesions in multiple stages of development, it definitely develops a lot more rapidly. This one can start on the face and then spread out, including to the hands and the feet. We might see lymphadenopathy there. Okay. So again, just to kind of try to kind of give some context um, to other potential diagnoses when we're thinking about um, a rash and what it could possibly be. All right. So at this point in time, I just want to talk a little bit about who we should be thinking about um, could have monkeypox, understanding that, you know, clinicians see rashes every single day. OK, and so we're not thinking about every single rash that we see. However, as I pointed out, we have um, a disease here that can present in multiple in different stages of disease that look like a lot of other things, in particular vesicles and pustules. So we do want to try to have kind of the idea of what a kind of um, classic or compatible rash for monkeypox might look like. OK, um, but then we also want to be thinking that about people that actually might be at risk. So certainly if someone has a rash and says, yeah, uh, I was um, 
at Fire Island, which we know is having a big outbreak of monkeypox, you know, or I know somebody that had a rash, or I know someone with monkeypox, you know, I think we all realize that's somebody that we're concerned about. The other folks that we're concerned about right now are persons who have had close uh, or intimate in-person contact with persons in a social network experiencing an outbreak. And right now, that is men who have sex with men or other uh, pers other men who have sex with men at, in, in this particular outbreak. Um, in the beginning of this, we were really concerned about history of, of travel to other countries that are experiencing an outbreak. Um, so certainly that is still a consideration, but I think it's clear that travel in, to, in the United States right now, especially to certain areas, is a risk factor. And something that I'll be saying again and again is that certainly because of um, the type of contact that is spreading monkeypox right now, um, there's gonna be a lot of consideration for, for STDs and we are seeing co-infections with other STDs. So I think that if you're thinking about monkeypox, um, especially if you're seeing a rash in, um, in a genital area or an area that could be related to sex, then we really need to be also evaluating those folks for STDs at the same time. Okay, and then I think the other thing, as I mentioned, because we are seeing um, a lot more cases of monkeypox than we've ever seen ever, we are starting to really see the breadth of um, what this disease can look like. That is also complicated by the fact that we are seeing a lot of um, close uh, sexual contact that is leading to spread. So we're seeing the, the, the rash in places of the body that really have not been seen as commonly before. So it's more atypical, but I think what we're really seeing is what this disease can look like when you have it spreading um, in a large population. And again, we'll be showing some pictures about that. So some people are presenting with just a single lesion, which is good. We want people to come to attention when they really have the beginning of their rash. But again, that can make it a little bit harder to decide, is this really monkeypox or not? Um, and But at the same time, we have some people who might be presenting with rash, uh, rash on different parts of the body. And that could be a little, a little bit tricky. Um, and some people might present with just like a fever or something. Now, the thing that makes this challenging is that we can't actually test people until they actually have a rash. So again, something else to keep in mind. And again, the fact that we're seeing rashes in parts of the body that we have, might not have seen before. We've also heard a lot about proctitis. So people might be complaining about um, rectal bleeding or about uh, rectal pain, and you can't actually see a rash because it's actually inside the body. And that makes it a lot harder as well. So these are all the things that we need to be thinking about um, when we're seeing uh, potential patients. So the first set of pictures are just gonna be pictures of um, general body parts, just to kind of give kind of a sense of what, when we're talking about a pustule, or I think people have, have seen the rash described, um, in this way, so firm, deep-seated, sometimes umbilicated. So trying to give folks an idea of what this looks like. And these are all, uh, I believe most of these pictures are from recent cases um, in the United States. So again, trying to give people the breadth of disease here. Um, so I think the take home here is, you know, what umbilicated looks like. So it does kind of look like it has a little divot in the middle. I think also that kind of reddish background inflammation is pretty classic um, for this rash. Um, especially in this um, pustule phase. And so definitely something um, to be thinking about. All right, so these are some more lesions on different parts of the body. I think for me, you know, seeing these, uh, this rash on the palms of the hand, the soles of the feet is, is something to, you know, really be thinking about. We need to be thinking about syphilis as well. Um, and we'll show some comparison pictures there. Um, but again, there's not a whole lot of things that cause lesions on the, on the, on those parts of the body. All right, so again, you know, even though generally monkeypox is um, a rash that progresses in the same way, so the lesions are gonna be in the same stage, that might not always be the case. And so here's just another situation where we can have some, uh, I, I always remember in medical school, like papulovesicular is not really a thing, right? It's really like some are papules and some are vesicles. And I think we are kind of seeing kind of that combo um, potentially here with some of these patients. All right, and then again, just some more pictures uh, just to kind of give the breadth of this. So I think a lot of these pictures kind of the, again, cause it's a pustule, we think that there's something under there that's trying to get out. So it's like whitish, but I think this picture in the middle here is important because it's 
it looks like it's more reddish. Maybe there's like bleeding in that pustule or something like that. So again, something else to keep in mind when we're when we're trying to look at these rashes. Okay, so now we're going to get into the pictures of the more sensitive parts of the body. So just so everybody is aware of that. Um, so again, trying to kind of show the different parts of the body where, again, if people are being exposed because of close sexual contact, we're going to be seeing these rashes on penises and vaginas and then in the rectal area. So trying to make sure that we are really thinking about that. Um, and, and again, if we're thinking about monkeypox, we need to be thinking about other STDs, especially syphilis. So again, trying to just show a, a comparison of pictures and how hard it can be. So on the left-hand side, we have secondary syphilis. Um, I think this is pretty classic um, for secondary syphilis, but uh, that's left-hand side. On the right-hand side, we have monkeypox. So a little bit more raised, um, these are more pustule-like. Syphilis is more um, kind of macule-like, less likely to be raised. But again, it can, it can be tricky. I'll show another picture where they look a lot more similar. So here's another one that I think it makes it is really tough, right? So secondary syphilis on the left-hand side in the probably a very, very early lesion of monkeypox on the right-hand side. And uh, I think if this was me trying to evaluate this patient, it would be really, it would really be really difficult. Um, so again, I think that's another thing here is just understanding that if you see somebody you know, you make your, your initial plan for diagnosis and testing and that rash continues to evolve, then we need to come back to and say, okay, um, maybe I need to be thinking about monkeypox, even if I wasn't thinking about it when I first saw this rash because it's changed. All right. And again, we know that patients have tested positive, not just for monkeypox, but for other diseases, um, STD and otherwise. Um, during these evaluations. So it's really important to keep that in mind. This is another great example. On the left-hand side, we have genital herpes. On the right-hand side, again, another early monkeypox. And these look very, very similar. All right, this was the one when I was going through these slides that was really tough for me. So on the left-hand side, we have primary syphilis. They actually have two shankers, which can happen, not a lot, but it does happen. And then on the right-hand side, monkeypox. Now these look, again, kind of like that, that herpes versus monkeypox picture. These look very, very similar. So again, I think it's really important that if we're testing for monkeypox in this, uh, in this situation, got to test for syphilis at the same time. All right. And then again, I think we're really focused again, because so much of the exposure of the patients that have been affected so far has been um, from sexual contact. We don't want to forget about the other diseases that people can have. So there definitely have been people who have been diagnosed with uh, with things like like chicken pox um, as a result of evaluation. And so whether at the same time or we look for monkey pox, and actually find out that it's not monkeypox, but we still need to figure out what it is. And so I think it's important, um, even for the patients where monkeypox is, is negative to, well, they still have something and it could be one of these other diseases that are more common. So here's again, another situation where we're comparing varicella on the left-hand side with monkeypox on the right-hand side and looking at some of the similarities there. All right, and then just a little bit on kind of lesion progression. And again, I think just to kind of show what it can look like, I think uh, this is also a place where we know that it goes through uh, certain stages, but what it looks like for individual patients is obviously going to be different. So this is just one example of one patient. Um, so just like for COVID-19, the day of exposure is day zero, and then the next day is day one. So here is just an example of somebody where they were able to get pictures um, almost every day, including multiple pictures on the same day to kind of show kind of what the progression was for this particular patient. So I think you see day four, they started that rash. You see kind of, it looks more of like that maybe push, uh, pustular, maybe vesicular, but then does evolve into that more, um, sorry, papular. And then it evolves more into that more pustular type of phase over the next several days. 
All right. And then this is another one just to kind of show what lesions can look like afterwards. So these are older pictures from previous outbreaks. Um, since we're still really in the middle of this outbreak, I don't think we've had a time to get as many pictures of what these lesions look like for the patients that are currently being affected in the United States. I hope we'll see more of that, but just trying to show kind of, um, kind of what how these lesions will evolve and what they could look like once that person is through their, um, their infectious period. All right, and then just a little bit about the complications. So again, the version of the orthopox virus for, that we're dealing with is the one that is less likely to cause severe complications as well as death. So that's one good thing um, that said, uh, we, do, we do need to be considerate, considering, you know, the overall uh, health of the person and what they might be at risk for. Um, and it, certainly the location of the rash, again, uh, a lot of the complications that we're hearing about are, are often related to where the rash is. So for example, the proctitis, you know, those are the types of things that we're hearing about in terms of complications, but also, you know, if this infection were to get in the eye, that would be, um, there'd be concern for um, super infection with bacteria and things like that. So just, so, uh, and I think we think about that with rashes in general, like they can get super infected, other things can happen related to them. Um, just something to keep in mind, but again, luckily for us, most of the infections are generally mild. All right, so a little bit about infection prevention, um, in particular for uh, the healthcare setting. So at this point in time, the recommended uh, personal protective equipment for uh, healthcare providers that are seeing patients that could have monkeypox are a gown, eye protection, gloves, and a fit tested NIOSH approved respirator, uh, N95 respirator or higher. So that is the current recommended PPE. Um, We'll talk a little bit later in terms of what happens if you are not wearing all of this and happen to have a patient with monkeypox, um, but this is the current recommendation for healthcare providers. Um, patients with suspected or confirmed monkeypox infection, so whether they're in the hospital, although again, most of these folks are being seen in the outpatient setting, they should be in a single person room. We do not need special air handling, so you do not need negative pressure, but we wanna keep the door closed if you can. And then um, in terms of the environmental cleaning, uh, the person that's doing that should wear the same PPE that the provider is wearing. And in particular, because we are concerned about potential spread from fomates like, and linens in particular, we wanna make sure that in the course of cleaning the room, we're not like shaking linens that would then aerosolize any um, lesion or virus material into the air. However, it is one good thing about this virus is that it is pre pretty easy to kill. So in terms of what would normally be used to clean a room, there's nothing special that is needed to clean the room. Um, it is just important that the person doing the cleaning have the appropriate PPE. Okay, so let's talk about testing. So um, as I mentioned earlier, the only phase of the disease in which we can do testing is when somebody actually has a rash. When somebody is febrile or has lymphadenopathy but doesn't have a rash yet, we cannot do testing. Um, so that's kind of the first thing. Uh, and in terms of the specimen collection, and I'll go more into that, uh, right now, the specimens that can be collected um, at the State Public Health Laboratory are dry swabs or viral transport media or lesion material. So actually like a crust or something like that. That is not required, um, but just showing what all of the specimen types that can be collected. Um, we are luckily in a place where commercial laboratories are starting to do testing. Um, LabCorp did start offering testing this week. I understand at least one other commercial lab is offering testing, I believe, starting today or very soon. Um, at LabCorp, I understand that only dry swabs are currently accepted. Um, so right now, to have a specimen tested at the State Public Health Laboratory, you do have to call us at the epidemiology program. I'm providing the numbers both for weekdays as well as after hours. There is somebody available to uh, talk about testing 24 hours, seven days a week, um, as well as to provide information on how to do the testing. Um, and the reason that we do this is to make sure that we're 
um, you know, providing guidance, but also making sure that there's good communication in terms of we would, will then tell the lab, say, hey, this specimen is coming um, and assist with transport and things like that. We also want to be able to have kind of that initial information to know, you know, how, how at risk is this person for actually having monkeypox? And so because of it's positive, we're going to jump right on that. So in terms of the actual swabs, you can use a sterile nylon, polyester, rayon, decron. Luckily, there's a whole bunch of things that you can use for this, but you do not want to use cotton um, or any other type of swabs. We have a lot of options here, um, but it is important for people to know what you cannot use. Dry swabs may be submitted in a sterile container. You can have one swab per container. Um, and as I mentioned, you can submit swabs in viral transport media. Universal transport media cannot be used right now. Okay, um, there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, I know this is an active area of discussion, but right now that uh, universal transport media is not um, allowed and that specimen will be rejected. Again, while de-roofing of a lesion is not required and you know, really is not necessarily recommended, um, if there is a lesion roof, so for example, maybe if somebody comes later on in their infection um, and that's the best lesion that can be obtained, those can also be submitted in sterile containers. And here at the bottom, trying to give pictures for kind of what these different situations will, will look like. So in terms of how we want this um, specimen collection to occur. So first, I mean, the thing to think about is we want multiple lesions to be um, swapped. So it is really, really important. We wanna be able, because one lesion maybe has less virus or something like that. So we wanna make sure that we are swabbing multiple lesions. So if more than one lesion is present, we wanna vigorously swab multiple lesions with two swabs per lesion. So part of the reason for this is that the testing that is being done at the State Public Health Laboratory is um, non-variola orthopox virus testing. So it is a more general test. We do not have any other orthopox viruses circulating in the United States. So if that test is positive, that is presumed monkeypox. However, we need to be able to have a specimen to send further on for confirmatory testing. So if we don't have that second swab, we do not have, we don't have the ability to do that. And we are still at a point where we wanna do that. So it's really important to be able to have that. Um, and again, if you have lesions from different anatomic sites or look like they're in different stages of development, those are also lesions that we would um, recommend be, um, be swabbed. Um, and sorry, I'm just looking out here. All right. And, you know, again, if you're thinking about monkeypox, you probably need to be thinking about other diseases. And if these lesions are in um, general areas, we need to be thinking about other STDs. So we definitely want people to be doing all of that specimen collection at the same time. So again, this is kind of routine stuff, but really, really important to make sure that there is no holdup in testing of these specimens. So you need to put the swabs in the container, one per container. Those, spec those containers need to be labeled. If they are not labeled, the laboratory cannot test them. So if, um, again, one swab per container or tube, one crust per, um, per container, if that's what you're doing, Every collection tube needs the patient name, date of birth, date of collection, and the source. So if, say you have two lesions or three lesions, write lesion one or lesion two. Um, that's going to be really helpful for, for the laboratory, especially if they're testing multiple um, tubes from the same person. And again, we want two swabs per lesion. All right, so just like you are writing all that important information on the um, specimen tube, you gotta make sure you're filling out the form correctly, okay? And again, this is like normal routine stuff, doesn't matter what kind of specimens we're collecting or sending to the laboratory, but you know, just like for any other laboratory, our state laboratory needs to have this, otherwise they cannot test the specimen or they cannot report out the result. So if, there, if any of this is missing, it's gonna mean either that the specimen is not tested or there's going to be a delay in testing and we don't nobody wants that so again it's really really important that name date of birth date of collection all of those things are filled out and match what you wrote on the tubes and you need a different lab slip for each body site sampled okay and then in terms of transport for this 
Um, you need to put the specimens in a bag and seal, one tube per, per specimen bag. Um, and then, you know, putting the, the form on the outside, the specimens should be refrigerated. And then right now, if you're sending it to the state laboratory and you do not have a courier, although we really would really appreciate if folks already have a courier available to use that courier, that's gonna help us make sure that our courier at the state laboratory is being used for the people that have no other way of getting specimens to the state lab. But if a courier is not available or cannot be arranged, then the state lab can assist with that. All right. So in terms of what we need to be telling patients in terms if who have monkeypox or suspected monkeypox. So if you think that if you're really concerned that somebody has monkeypox, then I think we need to be giving them this information while we're waiting for that specimen um, result to come back. So a person who has monkeypox needs to isolate until that rash has fully resolved. And that means that they have scabbed, fallen off and a fresh layer of intact skin has developed. This can take several weeks. This is really difficult and it's not going to be a set period of time. Um, it's going to be different for every person. So I've heard from other jurisdictions where some of their patients actually resolve, you know, more quickly, but some people can take longer. So I, this is going to, this is a difficult thing to talk to patients about. As I mentioned before, we don't want any infections in insensitive areas and particularly the eye. So we, people use contact lenses. We don't want them to do that. And when we talk about isolation, we're talking like about isolation like for any other disease, like COVID-19. So if they're in isolation, that means they're sick, they need to stay home, they can't go to work if they have to go to work. And if they need to seek medical care, they should ideally call ahead so that healthcare providers can have um, the appropriate PPE ready within the household. Um, they shouldn't have close contact with others. If they do have to move around a household, they should be wearing um, a surgical mask. Um, and ideally others in the household would be as well. Obviously, no close skin to skin contact, including sexual activity, um, when um, they're still considered infectious. We don't want people sharing potentially contaminated items. In particular, it's the bed linens, clothing, towels, but also glasses and eating utensils. So, this is a concern where if somebody, say, has a partner that they share a bed with, we don't want them to be doing that while um, they are actively infectious. And uh, while we have not heard of any pets or animals being infected as a result of this outbreak, I had mentioned earlier that in Africa, we know that um, animals do carry this. And so we wanna make sure that we're keeping um, animals and pets in the home safe. So no close contact with dogs and cats, don't let them sleep in the bed, um, have other people take care of them. All right, I am not going to go over this. I just wanted to say that this is in here in terms of providing some guidance in terms of treatment, depending on uh, what we might see or some of um, the complications are including simple things like, you know, a skin and, you know, a super infection or things like that for some of these lesions um, for monkeypox. So just to say that this will be in the slides. All right, so what are our options when it comes to either treatment? or countermeasures. So luckily we are in a place where we do have actually two vaccines available um, and I'll be talking about that. We also have a couple of therapeutics available. So one is TPOX, um, but we also have um, Sidofavir uh, and then Brinsidofavir. I think I did that right, Megan. <laughs> However, Brinsidofavir is not available in the United States. So um, we do have these two others. Uh, as well as vaccine immune a vaccinia immune globulin, all of these are available through the strategic national stock stockpile, which means CDC. So if we need to obtain any of these, I'll talk about vaccine in a minute, um, then we would be the ones to initiate that discussion um, with CDC. So call us if you're concerned about your a patient who has monkeypox who would need additional treatments. Again, in general, um, in terms of Actually, I can't remember. Okay, we do have TPOX here. Okay, so TPOX is an antiviral that was developed specifically to treat smallpox in adults and children. Um, and it has an EAIND, so it has like a special approval to be used in um, for orthopox viruses. And in general, would not be requested unless a person has very severe disease or potentially persons at high risk of severe disease. So they're immune compromised or already have um, a skin condition with, which we would be concerned about, or potentially the um, 
lesions being insensitive in atomic areas. So again, if there's a concern about a patient falling into one of these categories, then we can have that discussion um, with CDC about requesting it. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the vaccines because we are lucky that we are in a place where we do have vaccines available um, for, um, for monkeypox. And so we can talk a little bit about what that, where we are now with vaccine and where we think we're headed. So there's two vaccines, uh, the first and the one that when um, you hear about in the news about monkeypox vaccine or about what the federal government is doing, they are focused right now on this genius vaccine. So the genius vaccine is a live non-replicating vaccine. It is administered as a subcutaneous injection um, in two doses, at least four weeks apart. And a person is considered fully vaccinated two weeks after the second dose, kind of standard similar to COVID. Um, the data that we have um, for Genius is animal data and immunogenicity studies that where it can be used as PrEP. Um, we have less evidence for its use as PEP. However, right now that is the main use for that. So PEP being post-exposure prophylaxis, PrEP being pre-exposure prophylaxis. Um, the safety profile of Genius is actually very good, especially when we look at the other, um, sorry, vaccine. Uh, the other vaccine that we have available, it is safe in people who are immunocompromised, people with HIV, people with atopic dermatitis. We don't have a lot of data in kind of people that are pregnant, breastfeeding or in pediatrics, but could still be considered. But this is definitely a much better safety profile can be used in more people, um, which is why the focus right now and the ability, it's easy to give, right? You just need one, you don't need any special training to do it. And so this is the one that we're focused on and that we are have um, e much easier access to. However, there's not a lot of this vaccine available right now. Um, and that is partly what is driving where we are in, um, in the monkeypox vaccine arena. Um, it is licensed for use in prevention of smallpox or monkeypox in adults. Um, however, if it was needed to be used in, in um, a younger person, there is a process established to be doing that. Um, and when um, the ACIP made recommendations for using Genius, it was prioritized for people who are at severe adverse events with the other vaccine, um, but are also at risk for severe disease from monkeypox. So ACAM 2000 is the other vaccine and is if there is anybody on this call who has been vaccinated against smallpox was likely the vaccine that was received. Um, so this is a live replication competent vaccinia virus vaccine. So it really was meant for smallpox. And um, as you can see from the picture here is administered in a much different way than the standard vaccinations that most of us are used to. It's administered as a one percutaneous dose with a multiple puncture technique with a bifurcated needle. So definitely take some training. And to know if it works or not is if a lesion forms at the site of inoculation, it's called a take. And it is one dose fully vaccinated four weeks after the inoculation. So again, like I said, because it was really developed for smallpox, in terms of its efficacy to prevent monkeypox infection for PrEP, it seems like it is pretty similar to other live smallpox vaccines in terms of studies done in endemic countries. For PEP, we don't really know, but if the, it seems like it would work. However, I think that concern and the issue with ACAM 2000 is, um, is that it does have a significant side effect profile. So can cause myocarditis and pericarditis um, because it is a live replication competent vaccine. People can get other, um, can get progressive vaccinia from it or other complications. Um, and that as a result means that there are more people that cannot receive this vaccine. That said, there is a, a lot more of it available right now. Um, and so it's, that's why we want people to just be aware of it. Uh, like I said, right now, in terms of the allocations that we're expecting from the federal government, this is not part of those yet. I don't know if that would change in the future. So we want people to be knowledgeable about both of the, monkey, both of the vaccines that can be used for monkeypox at this time. So ACAM 2000 is licensed for use and prevention of smallpox in children and adults, but has a special EAIND to be used as PEP for monkeypox in adults and children, you know, and uh, 
all of the authorization and consent that would come from that. Um, so again, part of, of our ability to use this vaccine will depend on the on people being trained on how to actually give it. Um, and I think there's also a recommendation that folks who give the vaccine are also vaccinated. Um, and then making sure that people are knowledgeable about all the other um, considerations that would go into this particular vaccine. So again, just putting it here so people are aware of it, especially if we start talking about it more in the future. So in terms of post-exposure prophylaxis, like I said, both are available. At this point, we are focused on the Genius vaccine. Uh, recommendation for post-exposure prophylaxis is within four days of exposure. However, it can be beneficial up to 14 days after exposure. And so um, if we are hearing about somebody um, who is considered a um, close contact that would benefit from vaccine, we are going to offer it up to 14 days after exposure. Um, we are able to get vaccine for PEP very easily. Um, and so if you have somebody who, for example, says that they were exposed to somebody with monkeypox or had a partner with monkeypox in another state, uh, we can assist in getting that person PEP. And then, as I mentioned, there is, uh, we're in the middle of a whole um, process um, and program with the federal government where the Genius vaccine is being allocated to states um, at, with the focus on close contacts for post-exposure prophylaxis, but also potentially for um, people who might not have known contact with somebody, but could have been exposed. So that includes um, here, we talk about sex partners that were diagnosed, but I think we're also talking about people who um, are in social networks where we know monkeypox is spreading, or for example, have been to places or events where we know monkey, uh, people have been diagnosed with monkeypox. So um, I think everybody is probably aware that in the first allocation phase um, of the federal government, we did not get a specific allocation. Like I said, we have access to vaccine for PEP, that has not been an issue, um, but we are expecting another, an actual allocation um, in the next um, couple of weeks. So hopefully very, very soon. So uh, just to, for folks know, we just tried to put um, all of kind of the links to all of the things that will, that I've tried to cover today. Um, I wanted to put here just the contact information again for the for the DPH epidemiology program. This is to discuss testing. At this point in time, you still need to call us to be able to test any specimen at the State Public Health Laboratory, but also if there's questions about post-exposure prophylaxis for a patient. Uh, again, we are available 24 hours, seven days a week with the two different phone numbers. And then the Public Health Laboratory is available if you are a facility that does not have testing supplies. Um, we are happy to provide them so that, the, so that you're ready, but also for courier support. So I think that is the end of my slides and we, we have about 15 minutes for questions. Thank you. Um, I do just wanna say we've got a couple questions in the chat about the recording and the presentation. They will be made available. Um, we're work, I don't have an exact time frame yet, but we will most likely be sending them out to you. Um, and then they may be posted somewhere at a later date as well, but we will let you know about that. Um, and then, all right, Abby, how do I unshare? <laughs> oh, stop sharing. Got it. Stop Got sharing. It. Yep. Got it. Thank you. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> all right. So a few of our questions, um, I've got them categorized. So as for presentation of disease, first question is where do we find lymphadenopathy? Okay. So I think when we're talking about lymphadenopathy, we're thinking about where, so certainly if they have a rash, then that's probably the area of the body that you're going to be focused on looking for lymphadenopathy. So um, I'm aware of, of folks who have diagnosed persons with monkeypox and in the, in the area where they had the rash, they were also able to detect lymphadenopathy. Um, I think that if you had somebody that um, didn't have a rash yet, but had a prodrome, um, then I think doing a good physical exam, looking for lymphadenopathy in all the places that we usually look for lymphadenopathy is probably not a bad idea. So, you know, we usually look at, um, in the neck, we usually look under the, in the armpits, we look in the, in the inguinal areas. I think those would be the areas that I would be focused, um, in trying to detect lymphadenopathy. 
Um, please describe frequency of each of the symptoms, i.e. is fever present in all patients, lymphadenopathy, or is there a difference? Yeah. So as I said, because we're seeing so many more patients than we've ever seen, and not just, not just the United States, but in the world with monkeypox, we're seeing the full spectrum of disease. So some people are really going to have hardly any symptoms. And some people are going to have really a lot of symptoms. Luckily, we're still dealing with a disease that is relatively mild. However, most people are going to have fever um, and, and lymphadenopathy. Not everybody will. So again, this is, we're not talking about absolutes, but we're talking about um, really being in tune with the fact that, okay, someone has fever, lymphadenopathy, I'm going to really be paying attention to see if they develop a rash in the next five days. Thank you. Next question. What do the lesions feel like to the infected individual? Do they burn painful? Are they, are their reported sensations different from other diseases that may be helpful in identification? That is a good question. And I don't think there is a classic, um, thing here. I think it really depends on where the lesion is. Um, so I think a lot of these lesions themselves do not hurt. That's not my understanding, but if they are in a sensitive location, for example, in the anal area, then, then they might hurt or they might burn because of the location that they're in. So I don't think that there's a classic feeling. I do think that, that generally they are not painful, but I don't want anybody to take that and say, okay, they have a painful lesion. It can't be monkeypox because again, I think it really depends on the location of the body and then you know, where that lesion is. I do think that, again, I have not felt one, but my understanding is, especially those kind of pustules are going to be deep seated. So they're going to be like, you know, they don't move. They're going to feel like solid, but again, I haven't done it. I haven't actually been able to see a patient and, and feel these lesions. Um, so that does, that does make it ch challenging. I know. Thank you. Um, can an individual who has fully recovered from monkeypox become reinfected? Good question. <laughs> um, uh, ideally, no, but again, we've never had to deal with this many people um, that were infected at the same time. But uh, I actually don't know, Megan, if we have a time period for which we would consider people not infectious after they, or sorry, immune after they, um, uh, go through their disease course. Yeah, I don't think we have great information on the risk of reinfection at this time. Um, and so there is no recommendation to vaccinate people who have had an infection um, for future protection, but we don't know if they would be susceptible to reinfection at this time. And that is an evolving um, question. Yeah. Thank you. Um, are people who were in contact the day prior to physical symptoms a concern? Do, what do they need to do for prevention? And a follow-up question to that, if a case is diagnosed at the hospital, is the hospital responsible for contact tracing and vaccinating high-risk high risk exposures, or is DPH playing a role in that? Okay. All right. Can you do the first question first? <laughs> sure. So first question, are people who were in contact the day prior to physical symptoms starting, a concern, what should they do for prevention? So I have symptoms today. So I get a fever and lymphadenopathy today, but I was with a friend yesterday. That friend would not be considered a close contact or exposed. So only from the day that symptoms are present. Thank you. And then the follow-up or kind of additional question was, if a case is diagnosed at the hospital, is the hospital responsible for contact tracing and vaccinating high-risk exposures in the community, or will DPH play a role in that process? So as with other diseases, we would expect the hospital or healthcare facility, you know, it doesn't have, not a lot of these patients will be diagnosed not in the hospital, to um, do the risk assessment uh, of the healthcare workers that were potentially exposed to determine if they would be eligible for vaccine. And we, we do have a risk assessment. We shared in the provider memo yesterday, if we can put that in the chat, 
as well, Abby, that would be great. So we would expect, again, just like with other diseases that happen um, or that healthcare staff can be exposed to, we would expect the healthcare facility to um, determine who was potentially exposed, what their risk assessment was, if they were determined to be intermediate or high risk, for which PEP is recommended or should be considered, then we would assist in getting that vaccine to, um, to that facility. Um, they don't necessarily have to be vaccinated there, but I think that makes sense. We have had situations where we've had community contacts where a hospital had vaccine available and that was the easiest way to get those community contacts um, vaccinated. That doesn't mean that's gonna happen all of the time. However, with where we're at right now with the vaccine, um, I think that is something we will be asking um, providers that might already have vaccine to consider. However, they would not do the contact tracing. We would be the ones to identify additional contacts um, and getting their consent or their interest in being vaccinated. Okay, thank you. I wanna move on to a couple of the questions regarding PPE and exposures. Um, do the PPE recommendations apply to first responders and EMTs as well? I think they do, yeah, they, they definitely do. So I think it is helpful if people review the risk assessment to look at the different scenarios that are being presented. Um, I think it is important to keep in mind, you know, that if both the patient and the provider are wearing a mask, then that helps in the risk assessment. So I think that's really important and, and something that we're always keeping in mind. If someone has any respiratory symptoms at all, they need to be wearing a mask. Um, and that's not gonna just help for potential monkey box exposures, but COVID and lots of other things. Um, so that, that I think in terms, of, especially for emergency services, that's really, really important. Like put a mask on the patient if they have any respiratory symptoms at all. And I did just post that risk assessment, CDC's risk assessment in the chat. And I think that that answer kind of goes to this next question. If a provider who is caring for a patient with suspect monkeypox, who is later confirmed, does the provider, um, is the provider eligible for PrEP if they had all the PPE, but not the N95? So I think, again, that goes back to that risk assessment and what, what PPE was on. And again, right. that's- so and it also depends on what was happening with the patient. So there is a difference. So if, so I, so if you're wearing all the PPE, but a surgical mask and the patient was wearing a surgical mask and there was no aerosol generating procedure, that is actually either a low or a no risk. However, if there was an aerosol generating procedure, then that might be a, considered a higher risk. So each situation does need to be evaluated on its own and wearing as much PPE as you have available including a surgical mask if, an N, if a fit test and N95 is not available, is definitely going to be um, a good thing to do. Okay, changing over to testing, what is the turnaround time for the to receive a lab result? So um, we, you know, we've been testing for a couple of weeks and we have not had a lot of specimens. So the lab has been able to turn around tests Usually it's received them one day and then tested the next day. Um, so that is still the goal. However, I think, you know, we, uh, we've, we have one case in Connecticut. Um, we know that people are, we know there's probably more cases out there. We know there's gonna be more testing. And so um, we'll see. I think our goal is to get turnaround as quick as possible, but um, the lab is, it's really dependent on when it gets to the lab as well as there is, this is not unlimited capacity. Um, so as more commercial laboratories come on board, that's going to be really, really helpful, not only in making testing more available, but also um, making sure that people can get test results in a timely manner. That said, regardless, again, if you really think somebody has monkeypox, um, you really need to be giving them those, um, those precautions that they can follow and staying home until that test result is back. Thanks, and just kind of an add on to that, does it matter if we use DPH lab or commercial labs that are available? You can use whatever, there's no requirement to use the state public health laboratory. And certainly we, we encourage people to use um, a commercial laboratory that's offering if that it makes the most sense for your patient. I, 
So one thing I will keep in mind, uh, certainly for LabCorp and other laboratories that come on board, the testing at those sites will not be free. So we do want to make sure that people are thinking about the ability of a patient to pay their insurance status when making decisions about, um, about using commercial laboratories. If a person has insurance and there's no issue there, I think a commercial laboratory could be a really great way to make sure that a patient is tested. Okay, I wanna move on to some of the vaccine questions. Um, can we vaccinate a symptomatic patient? It is not recommended for someone who is symptomatic with monkeypox to be vaccinated. And once vaccinated, how long is the vaccine effective? Ah, I, I think I might need Megan for that. <laughs> I'm sorry, Abby, could you repeat the question? Yep. Once vaccinated, how long is the vaccine effective? So we don't, there's no redosing recommendation at this time. Yeah. So it is a one and done vaccine at the moment. Um, partially that is based on the kind of risk assessment that was done previously. Um, there may be repeat recommendations for high risk laboratory personnel, um, but for the general public there right now, it is a, um, it is a one and done vaccine. Thank you. Um, and what is the turnaround time from the time of requesting the vaccine to receiving it? So it's really going to depend. Um, and this is kind of an evolving situation in situation where we've already had requested PEP for folks. We were able to receive it in a couple of days, actually less than two days, um, but then getting it to the provider and things like that. So I think that's going to change um, as we get more vaccine um, and have it available here instead of having to make individual requests. Thank you. And then a couple of people are just asking about the case in Connecticut, if there's any more information available and is it, was it a likely exposure here in Connecticut or was there any travel involved? Yeah. We are not sharing any additional information about the case at this time. Thank you. Um, and then I just got one, did I hear correctly that surgical mask is safe and not necessarily, and an N95 is not necessarily needed? So I wanna be clear that the recommendation is that a fit tested N95 or higher respirator is worn. My comment, was that if a provider was wearing all of the other recommended PPE and wearing a surgical mask, and the patient was wearing a surgical mask, and there was no aerosol generating procedure, that might not be considered an intermediate or high risk um, exposure. But again, we, we really want to evaluate every potential exposure and interaction individually. So I would, go back and look at that risk assessment just to kind of familiarize yourself with the different scenarios that might be considered high, intermediate, or low. Those are not meant to be comprehensive, but I think they do address the most common interactions we would be um, thinking about um, in for healthcare workers. I'll just to add to that, Lynn, I think the important thing to remember here is that there can be respiratory transmission, droplet transmission, which is why we're recommending that respiratory protection, but also, especially when a patient's lesions get to the crusted phase, we're worried about there being transfer to linens that could be um, aerosolized by kind of movement of those linens. And so we're worried about both inhalation of dry particles, but also those inhalation of respiratory droplets. And so it's a combination um, protection. And so that's why the N95 is, is recommended. Um, but I, as Lynn said, I would definitely recommend reading that risk assessment very carefully. And if you're in the situation where you have treated a patient, um, DPH is, is available to assist with risk assessments of healthcare providers that may have had exposures. Thank you. Um, I know we are at time. Do we have time for one more question? That's just come in a couple of times. Yeah. Um, regarding that Fomite, do we know how long vi the virus can live on fomites such as the linens just mentioned? I'm going to let Megan answer that too. <laughs> uh, so while the virus is easy to kill when using cleaning products, we are concerned that it can live for a sustained period of time on linens. This will 
usually be more of a concern in the home environment um, than in, in healthcare settings. So we do want to make sure that if um, if you're a healthcare facility where the patient, you've seen a patient with monkeypox, we want to um, bag those linens in, in the room in place. We wanna make sure that the people who are handling those linens don't shake them or otherwise disrupt lesion material that might be present. Um, we do want them to be in proper PPE and then regular laundering will kill the, um, will kill the virus, but we do wanna make sure that you know, we're um, being good about our cleaning both on a um, daily basis, but also when we're treating suspect or confirmed cases so that we know we're, we're eliminating it from the environment. And again, it's those soft surfaces that we're really concerned about, those linens, those, those other soft surfaces. Thank you. Okay, folks, we are at a couple minutes past time. I just want to say thank you so much for joining. We understand that this is a um, rapidly evolving situation. And um, thank you so much for joining and for your questions. Dr. Sosar, Megan, do you have any final final words no i just want to thank everybody for joining we will make the um slides and recording available uh so and if we need to have another one of these in the future we can do that so thank you so much thank you